Not one, not just two, but we're going for three chapters in one class session. Strap on your seatbelt, okay? Because we're gonna, I don't think it's gonna be a bumpy ride. I think we may go a little bit quickly. As you know, um, during this section of detailed instructions on the tabernacle, sacred vestments, animal sacrifice, and worship of God, we're not hitting every verse, but I'm trying to lift up some of the imagery and help you understand it. Slip up a hand if you have a question. If I am in a good mood at that point, I'll possibly answer. But we're gonna to try to move pretty quickly. So let me just double check. I need to look around the room. Doesn't matter if you're at home on this one. You are here, you appear to be ready, and yes, here's an example, you are fully clothed. Everyone is fully clothed. And, and I bring this up, Alex has got nothing to do with you, you just came in at the right time. Isn't it interesting, one of the universal moral guidances that God gives us is practiced really in virtually every culture always, is clothing. Think, think about this, we're gonna talk again about the sacred vestments a little bit, but. Uh, we had so much of it in the last couple chapters, so I thought about clothing. Remember, as God created human beings, basically set us free in the Garden of Eden, and uh, there's no instructions that we see written about this. Maybe God pulled Adam or Eve aside and taught them, but uh, human beings had to, on their own, learn how to build a fire, how to prepare the food, how to work. But clothing... It says in Genesis 5, I believe, um, God actually stitched together and made and gave, God handmade, uh, clothing for people. So this is a way that God has differentiated us as his creatures from other creatures, like animals, that we walk upright, that we have intelligible speech, and that we are clothed. And thank you for behaving in clothing today in the way that you are. You've prepared for class. You didn't know this. Uh, but it is specially significant that God gave clothes, clothes to the uh, original mom and dad. Um, we'll talk more about that. But here's, here's something else I think you'll be interested to know right from the top as we get into chapters 29 to 31. The Torah gives such detailed instructions so that the worship of the one true God may not devolve into pagan practice, into pagan worship rituals. And that also may be another reason to highlight the clothing. But let's move on to the ordination of priests. 21, I'm sorry, 29 verse 1. Reading right from the top. Now this is what you shall do to them, the priests, to consecrate them so that they may serve me as priests. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish. So we're going to talk about animal sacrifice for a minute. I'm mindful that there are some of you here for the first time Yes, this class gets more interesting than animal sacrifice, but we have talked about how, well, this is done in a way that serves God's holy purposes. So it's not cruel or unusual punishment or inhumane towards the animals. This meat was eaten. So it was eaten by people just as people eat meat today and the protection and the care, the reverence shown these animals back in the day of Exodus is much greater than probably what's happened to the meat that you'll eat today for your meal, never mind the details. Now, Moses presides over the induction of priests. Specific instructions are given by God. Imagine the tabernacle is complete. We don't actually see that. The scene isn't truly set in this book until chapter 40, but you can imagine as these instructions are going there, they're doing this. And the, the temple uh, tabernacle is fully complete and we're going to walk through sort of the ceremony here, the highlights of it. Moses and the priests are adorned with their sacred clothing, these vestments. The animals are prepared for sacrifice. The bull, the sacred rams are slain as a sin offering. Why, you might ask? First, it's for the forgiveness of the sins of the priests. Aren't you relieved to know, right? Um, God does not call perfect people. So if you've ever had a congregation that you've been a part of, a priest or a pastor or a rabbi, uh, you would know that that person is not perfect, but you trust that God forgives and equips every person he calls, not only the priest, but all of us as well, right? Um, having come out of a pagan culture, the Israelites 
may have been tempted to confuse the significance of these ritual acts in worship, like the sacrifice of the bull or the ram. How so? Thanks for asking. Um, Remember, I mean, go back to the beginning of the book. If you remember the beginning of the story. In Egypt, everything was a god, small g, not a capital G, but everything was considered a god, including the cows and the rams. So in this ordination worship of God practice to ordain priests, killing the bull and the rams were significant symbolically. They were killing Egyptian gods. They were being sacrificed in obedience to the one true God. Remember the 10 plagues, or another way to understand that word is a strike, not unlike a military strike. It was God, the one true God, overcoming the myths, the gods, and the pagan practices of a powerful place called Egypt, and to show in that battle of the gods that our one true God is indeed the God most high. So in doing this animal sacrifice, they were also celebrating victory, showing again that that God has set them free from those pagan practices and those more immature ways of belief. Um, It's a animal without blemish. That's one of the next phrases there, without blemish in verse 2. The importance here is that the best of people's livestock were offered to God, rather than giving God what's left, what's left over. (laughs) Give God what is best, what is right, not what's left. Um, So it's important to offer God today from our own hearts or our own uh, lives what we think is best, not just the last thing I could you know, think of. Unleavened bread. Why unleavened? We've talked about this before, but I'm hitting some of the highlights about the significance. The symbolism in unleavened bread is that ancient Egypt was the place where the leavening of bread so that it would rise, you know, uh, that was invented in Egypt. That was the way of Egypt. And again, when God sets God's people free and, and teaches them to, to live a certain way, practice these certain practices in your daily life uh, and in your spiritual lives and your worship, uh, it's a way to make them distinct. You are set free from, you are now set apart from, not to say better than, but to say different from on a holy purpose to, to show the world God's way. Um, the unleavened bread was the way to do that. So Passover, it's a reminder that God's spirit passed over them, uh, saved them from that final plague, set them free from the slavery of Egypt. So God requires unleavened bread in this worship, setting apart, making holy is the word set apart um, from Egypt. Remember in Egypt also life was cheap. I mean, human beings served only one earthly king, the Pharaoh, and it was a culture based on death. Everything was about trying to get the Pharaoh to have eternal life, not you, not as an individual, a common person. All that you were worth was your productivity. Can you imagine a culture that says all that matters is how much you can earn or make or accumulate or produce? Never heard of such a culture. (laughs) That's completely foreign to us. Uh, But the book of Exodus, one reason I think it's so relevant today is that it helps us spiritually to be set free from those ideas, which are very much alive today, that a person, I mean, why do they call it net worth? You have to have a certain net worth to live right where we live, right? That, that should be a spiritual um, kind of a flashing light. Like, you know, my worth is so much more sacred than what I can do in the human body or accumulate in some human system in the, in the world. Although it is good, right? Uh, we eat well, don't we? Nobody's arguing with you. Okay, but there's more to life than that. And God has set us free from uh, a culture that says you're only as good as you can produce. And you have to work seven days a week and so on and so forth. So God's setting people free from that. Isn't that amazing? Still relevant today to think that way. Have you ever thought about it, though, that people who are the most successful in the world, when they retire... All of a sudden, there's, there's a sort of depression that a lot of people slip into. Because now, who am I now when I'm not that you know, CEO of my own company or all those things? When I don't, actually, I'm not required to go to the board meetings anymore. 
who am I now? What's my sense of worth? I've, I've seen a lot of people struggle. I, I've, buried, I've buried men within days of their retirement. It's a very interesting thought. Now, sorry, I'm getting off on tangent. Don't mean to preach. Teaching an exodus. Okay. <laughs> Set free from a culture that says you're only important if you produce. So what did God set us free for instead of working so hard? Worship. In relationship with God, we find our true worth. Okay, verse 4. How do you get to verse 4 already? I just think this one's fun. Okay, listen to verse 4. You shall bring them, talking about Aaron and his sons, the people for, for priesthood, right? The, these are the ordinands who are coming to be consecrated that day. And wash them with, so basically they got to strip down. I started talking about clothing. You didn't know there'd be a, yeah, here it is, um, a streaker moment. <clears throat> so they have to strip down and be washed with water, head to toe. This is a big deal. It's like a baptism, right? Important image. So they washed them, literally. Um, I've often been grateful being kind of a mainline Protestant where we just sprinkle a little water. You don't have to have any full immersion or special treatment like that. But they are washed, completely ready now. What is the symbolism there for washing, just like baptism? Cleansing. Think of all the different things you use water for. A uh, powerful symbol. God is... is physically cleansing them so everybody would know about the forgiveness of sins but it's a powerful symbol that they would know God is forgiving you um, anointed with oil next verse 7 uh, this is a symbol for the anointing of the priests for service it's not to make them special but to make them holy for God's service not a privilege but a service um, for most priests, the oil was sprinkled upon them. For the high priest only, oil was poured over his head, which, as Christians reading this, you might reflect on Jesus being anointed with oil. The word Messiah in Hebrew literally means anointed one, right? Uh, I'm going to skip down to verse 12 because another image, so you have the washing, you have the anointing with oil. Also, you have blood. So take some blood, verse 12, of the bull, put it on the horns of the altar with your finger, the rest of the blood pour on the base of the altar. What is going on there? Um, it is not a bloody mess. It sounds like it. I'm also grateful because I don't like to get my hands dirty uh, that my type of worship doesn't involve all of this anymore, thanks be to God. However, this was important, very symbolic then. The Israelite people were forbidden to eat the blood of animals because blood represents life. And the lifeblood must be returned to God. So some of it on the altar. Certainly they, they also um, sprinkled people. Uh, but pouring it on the ground was not disrespectful. Pouring it on the ground was a way of returning it to God by returning it to creation. The lifeblood, the symbol of God's life and gift. Blessing. God's gift of life to people. Um, I think even more interesting as it goes on, these different images, I, I really trip up on the organs, the, the use of the internal organs of the animals. And so I had to go a little deeper in research here. Verse 13, take the fat that covers the entrails, so on and so forth, liver, kidneys, all of that. What is the big deal here? Um, does anybody like kidneys or liver, chicken livers? We don't, you don't have to answer that question. It's not even near lunchtime. I'm not tempting you. But remember, all of these instructions are so that the people don't slip back into Egyptian practice. You know, they were brought up in this way. Um, they lived in a polytheistic, pagan practicing, worship life culture. I mean, everything, not just one hour a week, but everything was interpreted through these ancient myths and legends of Egyptian culture and others as they left Egypt, other cultures around them. So in Near Eastern cult practices, once um, when, when they wanted their holy people to tell them a bit about the future, right? For discernment, what kind of decisions should we make? Well, they would open up an animal in sacrifice to define the future. Um, the the way that uh, the pagan diviners would look at the liver, for example, um, not to get too much into detail here, but they could cut it up into as many as 50 pieces, and they would be reading the texture and the color and the size and the way that the uh, organs looked or how they came apart in terms of 
finding omens or portents, signs to follow to make a decision today about what's going to happen tomorrow. Our God does not work that way. So when we read these detailed instructions about animal sacrifice, understand it was a way to instruct people away from all of these thoughts that they learned all their life long about how to do things right. Well, you've got to um, read the liver. No, you don't. God doesn't work that way. Rather, God uses our rational mind, our moral will, and our intelligible words, language. Remember, God is a very word-based God. This is how, in the Torah, God created everything, not by working really hard, but by speaking intelligibly, speaking creatively and powerfully, and everything came into being. Now, um, like clothing, which is a gift that separates us from the animals, so is the power of the word, language, human intelligence. This is also a gift from God, and it's a connection with God, and it's part of the worship of God. So remember that the animal sacrifices were certainly an improvement upon human sacrifice, particularly the sacrifice of human children, which was common in many pagan uh, cults. Uh, no doubt that God does no longer will human sacrifice by the time the Torah comes to be, because we can remember in Genesis, remember Genesis 22, where God called Abram to take Isaac up the hill. Abraham was willing all the way to the top, but God says, stop, don't sacrifice your son. This was a teaching moment. I don't believe God ever wanted Abraham's son to die. Um, how could God ask that anyway? Well, we do believe in a God who did sacrifice his own son. So thank God for that. But what happens immediately when Abraham is willing and God says, you don't sacrifice your son, God provides a ram. There's a ram stuck in the bushes. So this transition to animal sacrifice is an important moral improvement and advancement from the pagan culture to the ancient Israelite culture so of worship. So it's important. Uh, Abraham then sacrificed the ram, Genesis 22. So again, the gods of Egypt, when, when the sacrifice is done, um, verse 13, um, they burn the parts of the animal, right? What they don't eat, they'll burn. And it's up in smoke, literally. Um, you could see how God has sent God's enemies or false gods up in smoke. Turn them into smoke at the end of uh, 13. Turn them into smoke on the altar, uh, which is a symbol that our God reigns. No one can defeat our God or destroy our God. But these other gods obviously can be destroyed, so they're not real. Um, let's read verse 20. Hope this one's helpful. You shall slaughter the ram, take some of the blood, put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, on the lobes of the right ears of his sons, on the thumbs of the right, and their big toes. Why, why not the little toes? No, I, I don't know the answer to why <laughs> toes. I'm not making fun of God's word. It's always interesting if you've been in my classes ever before. Not to make light of it, but isn't it human nature? I'm curious. And the Bible gives so much information about some things and not information about some other things that I would really love to hear. Um, maybe this is not going to make my top 10 list of questions to ask God on that first day, you know, in heaven where you have the orientation class. You, you know, this is what I'm hopeful about. I'm not kidding that, you know, there are questions. There are serious questions about human suffering, I think, are at the top of the list. But eventually, kind of want to learn more about this holy word that sometimes doesn't make sense. Here's the symbolism I could get from the rabbis from years and years ago. The image of the uh, blood, you know, on the ear and all the way down the feet, head to toe. God, through this symbolism of the blood, of the sacrifice, of the sin offering, forgiveness, from head to toe, God covers the sins of God's people, especially the priests here. It's a symbolic thing for them. It means the same for all of us, that we are covered with the blood. More on that in a little bit. Um, but it just seems so foreign uh, to someone like myself, a plain pot, uh, Protestant pastor, you know, very, very plain kind of worship when you think about our rituals compared to these. So with, with a tremendous amount of respect, I say, wow, this was something different to differentiate God's people from the pagan 
practices. Um, you know, let me say something about the importance of ritual. Because today, many people believe that you can keep your religious values, your moral principles, and your faith alive without regular worship or rituals. Can you imagine it this way, though, if you follow that logic? Can you imagine Thanksgiving without taking a day off from work, without getting together with friends or family, and without a meal together? Would that be Thanksgiving Day? You can call it that, but what is it without that ritual? of doing it, of getting together and having that holy day. We, we say holiday, but those mean holy days, holidays, right? Um, now, there's quite a bit of repetition as you read through verses in the 20s into the 30s of this chapter with the Rams. Um, again, I want to hit some highlights, and I would say to you, look at that paragraph on the second page of your handout, verse 38 and following, the daily offerings... Uh, chapter 29, I'm skipping down to 43. I will meet, this is the Lord speaking, I will meet with the Israelites there, the tabernacle. It shall be my glory, sanctified by my glory, says God. I'll consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron, his sons, I will consecrate, serve me as priests. I will dwell among the Israelites and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord, their God. Remember how frequently the book of Exodus has repeated words like this to teach us, to remind us, to invite us to live in the very living presence of God. God dwells among us. In Christian theology, um, our understanding of Christmas I am with you, God is saying. Emmanuel, God with us. Um, the first chapter of John, uh, the word became flesh and dwelled among people. That is, tabernacle is the word. Uh, tabernacled among the people. So it's this living presence of God in the people. So as I said earlier in the description of the building of the tabernacle, so specific, so many detailed instructions, and God says, and I will dwell you would expect the words to say, I will dwell in it, the thing. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that here either. What does it say? And I will dwell among them. God's presence <coughs> is among the people. Jesus said it himself, the spirit is within you. You may remember that phrase in Luke, but that Greek word, Greek word prepositions are very um, open-ended compared to ours in English probably better translated Jesus said the Spirit of God is among you it's a you plural it's not it's not just yes Bill I'm looking at Bill because he's on the front row no no nothing wrong with Bill um, the Holy Spirit lives inside of Bill <coughs> personally the believer the Spirit of God is in you just like the breath of life the Old Testament teaching God is that close that close with you even more powerfully the Spirit also lives among all of us together so the you in the Bible is often plural. Don't forget that, because English, we can't see it. God dwells among us. Huge point here. Don't want you to miss that in all of these worship instructions. So significant. Chapter 30. You ready for 30? Oh, my goodness. We're moving forward. We're, some of you are here hadn't been here as long as some of the others. You don't realize what a significant achievement this is to turn the page from chapter to chapter. We're moving quickly. All right. Chapter 30, altar of incense. You shall make an altar on which to offer the incense. Make it of acacia wood. Again, the repetition of acacia wood. Um, God not wanting for the people to give up trees that have fruit and bear food for people. Acacia wood is a tree that's not a fruit-bearing tree. Uh, but beautiful wood make all this out of it nonetheless. Um, chapter 30. Let me find my thought here. Yeah, the burning of incense. This becomes a big thing, too. Oh, my goodness. Um, the ritual worship in the tabernacle involved all the human senses. So think of all the different ways that you can experience the world as God has given you, you know, sights and sounds and feeling. Also, aroma. How powerful is the smell, the aroma? Oh, thanks be to God. I've said this to you before. I think the third sacrament for me is the cup of coffee in the morning. And the first thing I do is smell it before I even taste it. I love to smell the beans before I, I've told you this. It, aroma is wonderful. Um, 
The smoke, by the way, from the incense reminds the people of the presence of God again. Uh, remember, as they came out of Egypt, God was with them in the pillar of fire and the cloud, the pillar of cloud that they could see during the day. And so that smoke reminds them of God's presence when he led them to freedom out of the land of Egypt. Also, for those who are really paying attention, you might recall the first complaints of the people when, when Moses was saying, Moses and Aaron were saying, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna go to the, the head, Hancho, we're gonna go to the administration and we're gonna plead on your behalf to um, get you out of Egypt, out of slavery. And Moses makes his first attempt. He doesn't do it exactly the way God instructed him. Moses falls on his face figuratively. And the people are punished by, now you gotta make bricks without straw, remember? What was their complaint? You have made us stink before Pharaoh. You have made us malodorous, was the word. Now God is reversing the curse, and all the people are enjoying the good aroma, the sweet smell of spiritual worship. So uh, this is when Moses kind of comes out and kind of shakes his sacred garment and says, how do you like me now? You know, hey, got a good smell on today. Verse 10, are you ready for this? Oh, I love this imagery here. Chapter 30. Uh, verse 10, once a year, Aaron shall perform the rite of atonement there at the altar. Mm. So this, this might seem a little silly. Uh, and, and a friend of mine at Duke, back when we were in seminary together, he said, I'll always remember that word atonement for you know, what it means because you can just break it down. If you could, in English, just kind of take the word apart, at one meant. Atonement means now you're at one with God. That's what's meant by atonement, at one meant. And I thought, that's dumb. I didn't even write it down. And of course, here I am almost 30 years later, you know, telling you all this, that, that it is. It's the way that we cannot do it ourselves. People can't make ourselves at one with God. But God does through God's gracious mercy and forgiveness. And this ritual practice symbolizes how we are meant to be at one with God, not separated from God, but through forgiveness, we're at one with God. And there's a celebration of it. And it's going to be an annual celebration of it. And it's a powerful symbolism here. The ordination of the priests. They've undergone the sin, sin offering, the forgiveness of their own sins. So they're ritually pure, holy before God on behalf of the people. So now God forgives <coughs> all the people of all of their sins. If anybody's grateful for forgiveness, say amen. Amen. Now the census and the offering. Oh, you know, I'm a <clears throat> professionally religious person, and I often will highlight the giving of offerings in worship. <laughs> you know, it's written in my contract somewhere. That happens. No, but remember, right from the very beginning, in, in the first family, Adam and Eve and their boys, offering God offerings. You know, Abel offered out of his own way, and Cain offered offerings to God out of his own way. Way. There's always been an offering uh, to the Lord. Um, so I'm looking at the half shekel paragraph, uh, chapter 30, uh, verse 12. When you take a census of the Israelites to register, you know what? All of my Methodist ministry, we've been asking people to register their attendance in the pew or now online uh, in worship. And you know what? It's right there in the original instructions in worship. Uh, from God himself. So now, seriously, the, the registration is a military thing as well. So any male 20 years or older was ready to fight if necessary, and they needed to count them and know who they had on their side. Uh, but it's also for re uh, counting people for worship. Um, they shall give, verse 12, a ransom for their lives to the Lord so that no plague may come upon them for being uh, registered. And this has to do with the half shekel offering. Um, before anybody objects, I might say to my finance committee, uh, half shekel doesn't sound like a lot to us today. But the reason for it back then, shekel being kind of like the standard unit uh, for uh, currency, not to get into those details, but to say this, all people could do this. Everyone had a half shekel, right? This was not a huge... Uh, bar and women could do this men could do this children they didn't have to age 20 and above um, the poor even 
all people can participate in worship by giving. So that's one of the powerful parts about offering Old Testament and New is that it's all inclusive, that anyone can do this. And if you don't have that kind of funding, you can give of yourself in other ways, of your time, your talent, your service. Um, but let's look again at incense because this is repeated over and over. There's oil, there's a certain perfume, uh, special compounding and instructions to make sacred perfume for the use of worship. Um, you go on through these next verses going down to 21. Um, God seems very adamant in these repetitive instructions. Remember, the repetition is a way of underscoring or highlighting how important something is. Um, and deviation from these detailed instructions for worship could lead to death of the priest. Now, I would seriously be nervous if that were the case today. Thank God I don't, I don't believe so. I'm not a great rules follower at times, especially with detailed instructions. My wife could tell, don't, don't let her tell you. So many stories. I'm not good at following instructions. That's why I don't do laundry in my house. I did laundry the first week we were married. Messed that up. Never had to do it again. Right? There's wisdom in my mistakes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, verse 21, they shall wash their hands and feet so they may not die. So, so there's, you know, very high stakes at, involved in, in the right and proper worship of God in these ways. Again, it was, you know, not that God's vengeful like that, I don't believe, but that they would take it so seriously and not revert back to the ways of Egypt. Because you could take people out of Egypt, the harder thing was to take the Egypt out of the people, right? You know the old saying. Um, now, it's also interesting, I think, about all the different uh, verses on the incense or perfume, because even today, even today, perfume manufacturers have very highly guarded specific contents, the ingredients that go into their perfumes. That's got nothing to do with this. But isn't that fascinating for anybody who wears a cologne or a perfume? Some of you? Nobody? No, no you don't do it. Okay. Never mind that. Let's take that. Don't say that. No, it's, it's huge. I mean, those people in, in, in high and powerful jobs uh, putting together the concoctions they do for, for, for perfumes, I guess it goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Now, speaking of people who make creative things, that's where we are in chapter 31. Oh, I'm looking at my time on there. Can you believe in 30 minutes-ish, uh, we're into another chapter? Sorry, I just, I feel really good. Okay. This is, we usually don't go this fast, but you understand the content. We're, we're moving forward, hitting the highlights. Think of anyone out here who, who likes art. Just slip up a hand if you've ever painted or sculpted. Any, I mean, yeah, this is great. So I, I hope you enjoy this. I'll try to be brief, but also consider it very significant. Uh, chapter 31, the Lord spoke to Moses. See, I've called by name. It's rare that anybody gets a name other than Moses and Aaron, right? Some of the tribe leaders, Judah. <clears throat> All right. Bezalel, I'm not sure I'm saying that right. Son of Uri of Hur, um, of the tribe of Judah. Yeah, verse 3. I filled him with the divine spirit, ability, intelligence, knowledge of every kind of craft, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, bronze, so metallurgy. Um, there's, there's a lot of things going on here. Cutting stones, stone carver. That's a really big deal. Can you take a minute to digress with me? Remember, some of you may have heard this. If you haven't, really important. The New Testament imagery is mostly stones. Okay, think about Easter, but before I get to that, Christmas. We often talk about Jesus as a carpenter's son. I'm not going to take that away from you, but that's an English translation. He was a home builder. And if you know anything about first century Palestine, not a lot of wood, okay? Lots of stones. So Jesus would have been a stonemason, stone carver, somebody who builds stones together for worship like Peter. Peter's name, we call him Peter. Petra in Greek is rock. So Jesus really pulled him aside and said, hey, Rocky, on this rock, I'm gonna build my church. And Peter wrote in his letters, you are like living stones made together into this living temple where God dwells among you today. So you'd be saying that to us today as well. So God has always done 
great work with stones. You know, our God is a rock, our rock and redeemer, all these things. And on Easter, if you're into that sort of thing, like eternal life, if that's interesting at all to you. Yeah, God raised him from the dead and rolled away the stone. You know, this power of God on display in concrete, we might say. You know, it's not abstract. This really happened, and Jesus really was and is a homemaker. He makes a spiritual home for us even today. So there's great value in this sort of craftsmanship and artistic design and creativity in any form that you find it in your life. Creativity and beauty, the fact that almost every human being is naturally drawn to that which is beautiful. How come nobody's looking at me? No. Uh, but we're all drawn to that in art, in nature, in one another. In life, it comes from God, the first artist, the great creator of all creativity. And so God names these artisans. Uh, the next verse, um, verse 6, I appointed him with Aholiab. I'm, I'm not saying that right, but um, from the tribe of Dan. I'm skipping through. <laughs> uh, given skill to all the skillful. You know, God recognizes those who helped to create the tabernacle and all the sacred objects for worship because, as you already know, there is beauty in life and those who help to create or recreate beauty are in the very you know, pattern of God, uh, doing the very work of God, and that's a beautiful thing. So that's lifted up. If you've ever been in a holy space, generally speaking, whatever religion you're from, uh, Jewish, uh, my Muslim friends, Hindus, Christians alike, beauty in our sacred spaces. Even the most plain chapel that I've been in has the beautiful interplay of light and the lines of the, maybe it's just square-backed pews that they've built, but there's something in it and God recognizes that and we should recognize it in worship as well. And uh, yeah, so in any way that you are following in that pattern of beauty, um, your art, your use of talent, all of that even if you're just doing it for fun and relaxation, all of that is part of your worship of God. If you, if you use that heart, if your heart is directed in that way, sure. I got to say something about Sabbath, all right? Um, the Sabbath is a rhythm, an echo, a repeating theme all through the Torah. Have we talked about it in Exodus? Those of you who've been here every week, you might be getting tired of this, but I think there's still more to come learning about the Sabbath. So Exodus is a book of remembering and remembering rightly. And God continues to say, remember the Sabbath. So remember the very first thing that God makes holy is not people. It's not places. It's time. When God created all things, God took a day off. I mean, did God get tired? I mean, that's when we come to the Bible first with philosophical questions. We have this sort of mindset because we're all so sophisticated and well-educated already. And we, we ask questions like, you know, the old philosophical question. Can God make a rock so big that he can't pick it up? You ever thought about that one? I mean, there's no answer, right? Because either way, you answer it, you think that God can't do something. And that's just not true. But that's just the limitation of human language and intelligence, right? So we say, oh, God rested. Did God get tired? It's not that God, God knows what we need even before we know. God supplies what we need even before we ask for it. And the first thing we need is a regular rhythm to life. So God worked six days to create everything, made a day that is holy and sacred, a day for rest. And so the Sabbath, again, is repeated so that people remember this rhythm comes from God. As you treat time as God treated time, holy, then you will experience the blessings of that holy rhythm of life. And it's good to take a day off, right? Is anybody retired in here? <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good to have this. It's part of the rhythm and the reward that you might be rest and refreshed and retired at some point in life. God wants it that way. Now, we interpret things differently. We don't, uh, don't we, in different religions or even different denominations of Christianity. So the Sabbath is the seventh day. Obviously, it's Saturday. If you speak Spanish, El Sabado, right? The Sabbath. So Christians tend to practice the day off on Sunday. The worship day is the Lord's day. And how can that be? Because my seventh day Adventist friends have tried to convince me otherwise. All right. And I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying more, more often than not, those types of arguments have come from people who have a different practice. 
And so I'm not thinking that it's, you know, anything wrong with them to worship on a Saturday. I just don't want them to tell me it's wrong to worship on Sunday because who started it? Jesus with that coming back from the dead thing that he did, right? I mean, he did it on a Sunday. So every Sunday since that first Easter, we celebrate a little Easter, a echo of the resurrection day. And so Christians celebrate Sabbath on Sunday. Now, some people who are very precise about the law would say, I'm breaking the law doing that. I say, well, okay, but I'm in good company. Jesus broke the law quite often. You know, and so we'll be okay with that. Um, we interpret the Old Testament through, that's why we call it Old Testament. Jews call it the Hebrew scriptures. So that's fine. I'm respectful of both, but let's not think that we're doing something wrong by worshiping the risen Christ on Sunday, because he rose on Sunday, and the whole of Christianity has done it ever since. Um, but we have differences of opinion, differences of interpretation, and the way I teach is believe and let believe, but let's understand what we believe and why we believe it. So allowing my friends who are Seventh-day Adventists to do that, I love it that they're vegetarian, by the way. That's a different story. Um, should cover that more on Animal Sacrifice Day. Uh, anyway, um, think about Muslims. They have a holy day, Friday. Or my Jewish friends. Saturday is the Sabbath for us uh, as Jews. So good, that's fine. Uh, the point is the rhythm. I think the point is to have a sacred day. I think the point is to follow God in resting. That even God took a day off, you and I should. Because remember, differentiating us from the pagan practices that say all that life is about is your productivity. Keep working, earning, accumulating so that you can climb the ladder of success, right? No. Oh, who works seven days a week in Egypt? The slave. God says, I've set you free from that. You'll have a day you'll remember not to work, but to make it holy and be in relationship with God and relationship with the people you love. Okay, I've made too much of a speech on that. Didn't I? All right. Um, interesting that there's the death penalty mentioned again. Okay. Now, I did a little more research on this. One of the rabbis that I listened to, you know this. Um, Dennis Prager is one. And then I go to the half Torah. And it's in each of my sources, I, I was surprised to learn, it's happy to learn, it, that even though it mentions the death penalty for breaking the Sabbath law, there's only one instance in the Torah where that happens where God actually puts a man to death for working on the Sabbath. It, in history, appears to be the case that it is not practiced, that people are not normally put to death for breaking this law or others uh, like we covered in the Ten Commandments. Why? Thank you for asking. Well, it seems to be that God uses this language, includes such heavy punishment or consequences into the Torah so that it would be a deterrent that people would not do. It's a way, look, back then they did, have, they did not have like your newspaper. Anybody even read the paper, newspaper anymore? Somebody? Not many of you, a couple of you do. Okay, you remember what the newspaper, okay. So the newspaper has a headline, right? It's a big, bold print. It's in a darker print, it's bolded, and it's enlarged. Couldn't do that in ancient writing, right? So this is the way to really highlight and emphasize and say, don't do that. You remember I told you that story about the, the country doctor where the, where the guy comes to the country doctor and, and says to him, you know, doc, my arm hurts really bad when I move it like this. And he's twisting it up behind his back. And the doc says, what? He says, yeah, my arm hurts really bad when I do it like this. And the doc says, well, don't do that. You're not supposed to do that. God didn't make you to do that. And, and that's exactly what it is with some of these commands is just don't do that. You're not made to do it that way. That's why it hurts. So in the scriptures, God will use some of this really strong language, even though the people never did practice it. And I'm relieved that they didn't go around killing each other. I honestly don't believe God wants us to kill anyone. God does not desire violence. That's one of the first things we learn in Genesis and throughout the Torah. Um, here we are on a much more serious note. Uh, as I'm teaching this class, there is war in Ukraine. The aggressor is Russia, or I should say at least their president. Um, why do you think the world has reacted against that? Why do we feel it's wrong? The vast majority of human beings on earth today, regardless of your background, your nation, your creed, we think that's wrong. It's because of the morality revealed in scripture, the teachings of the Torah, and the nonviolent way of Jesus. 
we all have learned the world has changed over the centuries and we don't want war. So thanks be God for that. Um, I want to look at a couple things. We're running out of time, but we're almost there. Um, remember that God loves freedom. God has delivered people from slavery. Um, that is working just for production only, like feeling like you're a cog in the machine. Um, God wants us to be free. Now, there are these ways, because freedom, freedom is not free, and with great freedom comes great responsibility. So there are these ways, these specific ways, and I'm going to say one or two more things about the Sabbath and wrap it up. I think the Sabbath is such a, not my thought, <laughs> the teaching is so significant about the Sabbath because it is a superior practice. How so? Well, circumcision was the mark of the Jews, but it was not unique. It was actually practiced in some of the other uh, ancient cultures. Um, so it was not unique to ancient Israelites. Um, plus, circumcision was hidden from sight. We talked about being clothed. We're all grateful that God gave us clothes and we enjoy our clothes. Uh, but you couldn't see circumcised men at that. And by the way, it was just for men at that point. So that's only a one-time observance as well. The Sabbath has much more beneficial uh, practices. Think about it. The Sabbath is greater than circumcision in all these ways. Um, it was unique to the Israelite people, therefore a very strong witness to the rest of the world. And it's something the world could see. It was an outward sign. Uh, could be practiced by every person and practiced with great repetition, not just a one and done, but every single week. You took a day off and people noticed that. All the believing people could do it. I love this piece of it. The women could practice the Sabbath. They were included. The children practiced the Sabbath. They were included. The poor practiced the Sabbath. They get included. Everybody gets included in the weekly devotional practice of Sabbath keeping. What a blessing. What a gift God has given in that way. And how might you and I seek to restore a little bit more of a Sabbath practice? That's something for you to answer for yourself if you like. Um, I'm going to wrap up by looking at verses 17 and 18. Right at the end of your handout, at the end of chapter 31, believe it or not, in under an hour. So far. Clock's still ticking. Hold on. Looking at the end of chapter 31. I can turn my paper right. Um, end of verse 17. Talking about the Sabbath. And then, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. That word refreshed is added here. I don't believe it appears in the, in the Genesis sequence, um, creation sequence. God rested and was refreshed. I've already made my little point about, you know, God doesn't really need, I mean, God is God and doesn't really need the refreshment himself. But, but it, it sounds like an added bonus that people need. We need rest, but we also need that recreation. You know, I've said to you before, uh, God is creator. So much of the books of Genesis, Exodus, and following prove how the creator connects with the creature, you and I, and how we participate in God's recreating of the world. And our English word for recreation literally is a recreation. When we do something, like using our artistic talent, stopping the workaday stuff, doing something special, worshiping God, uh, connecting in fellowship, studying the scripture even. There's a refreshment. There's a recreation in our souls that God knows we need it. So God demonstrated, leading by example, God rested and was refreshed. And so when we follow God's pattern in life, when we worship God, we also will rest for our souls and we will be refreshed in our mind and spirit Thank God for that. Here's a powerful thing. Are we done? You don't want me to skip that last verse, do you? Completely. It's like a turn of the page, even though the, the people who put in the chapter and verse designations oh, a thousand years ago or so uh, left it in chapter 31. It's like we, we return to the story. We return to Mount Sinai in verse 18. We return to the action. Action from God on high himself. What? The Ten Commandments. Remember, God finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai. He gave him the two tablets of the covenant, tablets of stone, 
written by the finger of God. Amazing. You think God had good penmanship? I bet, I bet those were like perfect tablets. I bet it looked really good uh, carved in stone there. God's like that old country doctor who says, take two tablets and call me in the morning. <laughs> right? Take these two tablets of stone. Uh, take, the, take the commands of God to heart and you will find healing, rest, and refreshment, no doubt. But uh, the good news is we, we've kind of come through, you know, we went through the Book of the Covenant following the Ten Commandments. We've been through the building and instructions of the tabernacle, uh, sacred vestments, uh, animal sacrifice, all these details about worship. And we're coming back to sort of the drama of Moses and the people. And let me tell you next week, you don't want to miss. I know we got to be a little early, reminding you guys 930 next week for just that Tuesday right here uh, because of scheduling conflict. But the point is, there's going to be some drama. The story's not over yet. Has anyone in your life, you probably have human beings in your life like I do, has anyone ever disappointed you or broken the rules? Yeah. All right. Think about how God's going to feel about that. But as we leave, let me leave you with some more good news. Just to recap where we went and what happened in these three chapters. Exodus, I think, is so relevant still for us today because remember, as believers, you are the priesthood. This is not just for Aaron and his sons or special religious professionals today. No, this is for every believer in God through all time and space. You right now, you are a royal priesthood. You are priests and priestesses. It's hard to say. Men and women alike are priests. All believers. Um, the priests were washed and clothed, anointed and forgiven, dedicated to God and marked by the blood. So are you. You are believers and priests together to serve God with all these same blessings all these same credentials, all these same uh, ways that God is present among you so that you can show a good way of living life so that others might believe in God as well. That's the point of this whole thing. All right, I'm going to take a few minutes for questions and answers if you got them. Yeah? I just had an interesting thing go through my head while you were talking about why Christians celebrate Sunday. Yeah. You know, Jesus died on Friday. He rested on Saturday celebrating the Sabbath, and then he did his work of rising on the first day of work again. Right. Yes, that's interesting. Dick, uh, you know, so he's, he's noticing that Jesus died on Friday, and sundown would be the beginning of the Sabbath. Sundown on Friday, Jesus had to be off the cross to put him in the tomb. And while he's in the tomb, he's in the tomb on the Sabbath. He's resting. That's right. And then he does the work of God by rising on Sunday, first day of the work week. And that's his first action, is victory over death. That exodus from the tomb. Yeah, great, great. Glad to hear you putting that together. And very true, very special. Change the world. I know it's, it's hard to top that. But anybody, any questions? <laughs> questions, comments, wise cracks, any, any, anything at all. Well, I, I just think everything God does is for our benefit. I mean. Yeah. God does everything for our benefit. And the washing. 